is Pastor Lauder Milton from the Cross Church. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about our services and our service time and invite you to come and worship with us. We have many wonderful programs in place that would be a blessing to your family, our children's program, our teenage program, and, and the Bible studies and the church services that are geared for each member of your family. Way of the Cross Church is located at 612 Beatrice Drive in Riverside, Ohio. Riverside is a small community between Dayton and Huber Heights. Beatrice Drive is a connector street between Brant Pike and Harshman Road. The church is located again at 612 Beatrice Drive. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., of course, our main service. We have service on Sunday evening at 6.30 and then our midweek Bible study for adults and teenagers and children of all ages is on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. I sincerely invite you to come and be part of these services, and God bless you as uh, you watch the program this evening. Okay, I want to speak to you just for a few moments and follow, continue with this wonderful theme. I want to use a passage of scripture that you will all remember, but you'll wonder, Brother Bill, is that a good text for Mother's Day? We'll find out. Okay, I'm going to read to you from 1 Kings chapter 3, and I'll start at verse 9, and Solomon Solomon is praying for wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. This was his prayer. Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. And Solomon's prayer, it says, Please the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourselves understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any be like you or arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. King Solomon, the wisest king that ever lived, and he asked God for his wisdom. And God said, I want you to have wisdom so that you can make sure that justice is done. A little bit of time goes by. And one day, for reasons that we have to surmise and think about, the king agreed to hear a case, a grievance between two mothers. Verse 16. Now, two mothers who were harlots. You all know what that means, don't you? Two mothers. Don't, I heard a nervous cough just then. Two mothers who were prostitutes. Two mothers who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. And one woman said, Oh, my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house. And I gave birth while she was in the house. Then it happened the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth. And we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house. And King, this woman's son died in the night because she she laid on him. 
You know, they tell us at the NICU unit, one of the most important things that you can do to protect your child is to make sure your child never sleeps with anyone. You know, it's good to be close to their mother, and they, they, they encourage you to have this sleeping arrangement where the baby is close to the mother, but never in the bed because it's so easy to overlay a sleeping infant. And so this, this mother says, this mother says, this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. So she arose in the middle of the night and she took my son from my side while your maidservant slept and she laid him in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. Can you imagine the trauma? Can you imagine the anxiety? Can you imagine the note of, 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 of passion in this mother's voice? And King, when I rose in the morning to nurse my son, there he was and he was dead. But when I examined him, when the, when the light came up, when the sun came up, when I examined him in the morning, indeed, he was not my son whom I had born. And the other woman said, oh, no, 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 no. The living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, no, no, the dead one is your son. The living one is my son. And thus they spoke, and we can read it in the text, thus they spoke back and forth before the king. And the king said, the king who had prayed for wisdom that justice would be accomplished, the king says, well, this one says, this is my son who lives, and your son is dead, is the dead one. And the other says, no, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. And then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought the sword before the king, and the king said, divide the child. Sever the child in half. Give the, give the head and the shoulders and the torso to one mother and the, the rest of the body to the other mother. Oh, what a terrible thought. What a brutal imagery. And then the woman whose son was living, she recoiled in horror and she said to the king, she didn't just speak to the king. I know she didn't. I know she screamed to the king. She said, the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. And I've been reminded in the past weeks of my life of the intensity of the love that a mother feels for her newborn child, for her child, as I've watched my daughter care for her little premature born child, her little son, there at the hospital. She said, oh my Lord, give her the living child. And by no means, no, by no means kill him. I would imagine she's on her knees with tears flowing down her cheeks But this time. But the other woman, the other woman who claimed to be the mother of the child, she said, ah, let him be neither mine nor yours. That's a good decision, king. Divide him. And so the king, in the wisdom that he had prayed for, the king answered and said, give the living child to the first woman and by no means kill him, for she is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. You all know this story. You've heard this story many times. It's a classic story. Uh, and, and it certainly illustrates the wisdom that God can give to those who ask for it. The Bible teaches us if any of us lack wisdom... We can ask God for wisdom and he will give it to us. How much more? How much more would God honor the request, the prayer of a mother to, uh, to give wisdom to her, to be able to take care of her child? Now, but this story also says something else about motherhood. And I'd like to share just in the next few, very few minutes 
I'd like, because I know today is a holiday and I know you have plans. So I just want to take a few minutes to share this thought with you. And, and here is a truth about motherhood. This is the motherhood truth number one that I see from this text. Simply this. God cares about less than perfect mothers. There's no such thing as a perfect mother. There really isn't. And, and, and because this mother was less than of sterling character, doesn't mean that she did not love her child and have his greatest interest at heart. No one needs to be loved or respected more than our mothers. We are supposed to honor them. But simply, being a mother doesn't make you perfect. But you can be less than perfect and still be a good mother. You see, this lady was a prostitute. I don't know what circumstances in her life brought her to that place. Poverty can do terrible things to people. Neglect of family members can do terrible things to women in vulnerable situations. Bad choices compounded can bring a person to a low estate. I don't know what brought her to the place of being a prostitute. While we were on vacation, we were at Walmart one day and we were looking through this big bin, big box that has movies that are discounted. And I ran across a mini-series uh, that I had watched one part of the series. I always wanted to see the rest of it and never did have a chance to. And there it was. And I bought it for, I think, $3. And it is right up there beside Hoosiers with me. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, the, na- the title of the, this TV miniseries is called Broken Trail. And it stars Robert Duvall, and anything Robert Duvall plays in, in my opinion, is a good movie. That's, you know, I I think he's a great actor. There's also a young man named Thomas Hayden Church who co-stars with him. Now the storyline is simply this. Robert Duvall is an old cowboy. (laughs) So right there you got me. And his nephew... His nephew, played by Thomas Hayden Church, is a young guy just trying to find his way in life. And Robert Duvall, in the wake of this young fellow's mother's death, Robert Duvall's sister in the story, he wants to take him under his wing and try to help him become all that he can be. And so he comes up with this idea to drive this herd of wild horses from Oregon to Wyoming to the border between Wyoming and Canada where there is a market for wild horses to the Canadian Army. Uh, and so they, they start out on this journey. Has anybody seen this movie besides me? No? Okay, one or two of you. I'm telling you, it's a great movie. It's got a little bit of language. You know? It's got a little bit of violence. But you know, there's violence in the Bible. Uh, and, and anyway, the story is they, they start this... They're going to drive these horses, and the proceeds from the sale of these are going to be to help this young man get a start in life. In this long journey, hundreds of miles, this journey, they have a lot of trouble of the road, and they meet a group of young Chinese girls who had been sold by their family into prostitution, into slavery. And they also met an older woman who was kind of, had become the surrogate mother for these, these young Chinese girls, who had, because of the, just the starvation and all the deprivation of, of, of life on the frontier with nobody to care about you, had also been a part of a brothel. But they all wanted a different life. They didn't want that. And there was a, A gang of thugs. Now, you know what makes this story so great is it is a true story. Did you all know that? Robert Duvall Duvall was one of the producers of this, and he he was so excited to tell this story because the descendants 
of these Chinese girls and this young man, Tom and Hayden Church, still live on the ranch in Wyoming to this day that was bought from the proceeds of selling these horses. Well, there's a gang of thugs that are after these girls for evil reasons, and, this, and they also want to take the horses away from Robert Duvall and his nephew. And, and so, you know, that's the storyline. And at the end, all you, you follow their adventures till they get to Oregon, excuse me, to Wyoming. They sell the horses, and and uh, you know, the, and and the young young nephew goes out to round up a few strays. And in his absence, here comes this gang of thugs, and they capture the old cowboy. And they're just about they're going to and they're going to take these girls and and they're going to kill this this older woman. And they're going to take these girls and they're going to do what evil, wicked men would do. And they, they have this old cowboy played by Robert Duvall. They have him and they're just about ready to kill him. And unbeknownst to them, the young nephew returns and he, he, he doesn't even know what's going on. He comes up behind the barn, comes up out of a draw, leading the horses he had been able to, to corral. And, and all of a sudden, he hears his uncle give a an old Comanche Indian call in defiance to what they... And his uncle didn't know that his nephew was there, but he was just defiant to these terrible men. And he looks around the corner of the barn, he sees what's happened, and this young man... <laughs> I love this scene. It's, it's violent, but it just does something to me about justice and righteousness. You know, he takes a deep breath, and he all, you can almost hear him whisper a prayer... He levers around into his Winchester, steps out behind that barn, and in 30 seconds, there's four dead bad men on the ground. Justice. On behalf of some girls who've been sold into slavery to be prostitutes. I don't know the circumstances of this woman in the Bible, but God did. And the reason her story is in the Bible is not just to illustrate Solomon's wisdom, but to remind you and I that God is not only about righteousness and morality and purity of heart and body and soul, but God is also about forgiveness and restoration and right decisions and right compassion. Amen. Amen. So the first truth, and, and I can't take that much more time on the others, is just God cares about less than perfect mothers. That lady needed a savior like everyone else. I would like to remind you that being the best housekeeper, being such a great housekeeper that you could be, have your house displayed on the pages of good housekeeping doesn't make you a perfect mother. I would remind you that being the best cook where the people would give you a television show where you could teach others how to cook would not necessarily make you a perfect mother. I want to encourage you to remember that wearing a size 8 and a black dress doesn't make you a perfect mother either. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our best efforts are less than sufficient. We are all sinners. We all need to be saved. And God saves and loves less than perfect mothers. So mom, bring your flaws and your foilables and your circumstances that you inherited, and the sins that easily beset you, for we all have them, bring them to the wisest king of the ages. He has wisdom to help you today. Amen. The second thought I would share with you is God cares about a mother's problem of loss. There's no such thing as a problem-free motherhood from birth to grandchild and beyond. I listened to Margaret. You know, she, she told us her age. So Margaret's been doing this for a long time. But from the day that she became an expectant mother, even this very hour, the love and concern for her babies and for her sons, her daughters, her grandchildren, has never left her heart, never left her mind. Once you become a mother, you're never free again, are you? You know, there's an old saying that says, when they're little, they're on your toes, and when they're older, they're on your heart. Amen? Does any, any, any older parent here know what I'm talking about? So God cares about a mother's problems of loss. 
He cares about a less than perfect mother. He cares about the loss that we experience. This lady had a, a serious loss. She had a serious problem. She had a serious loss, but God had a serious answer. God didn't give Solomon wisdom just to impress people. He gave wisdom to help this lady in her dilemma. And I want to say to you mothers, God will help you with all kinds of problems. The Bible says that God is a present help. Do you hear me? A present help in the time of trouble. Mothers, grandmothers, when you don't know exactly how it's all going to turn out, you don't know what kind of situation you're facing, and you just, you just, oh, you're praying and you're crying to God for an answer, I want you to understand that God will help you with all kinds of problems. He's a present help in the time of trouble. He is your refuge. He is your strength. He is your wisdom. Your help comes from Him. Motherhood message number three is God cares about a mother's love. The real mother in this story would rather see her contemporary, the other woman, raise her son as her own than to have such a terrible fate befall her child. The truth, the truth of it is, God's love models for us what mother's love is. You see, motherhood is characterized by personal sacrifice. That's pivotal to motherhood. It begins by sacrificing one's own body and one's own health for nine months. There, I, the mother's body becomes bloated and burdened, a, a burden for her to bear, and that's just the beginning. The, pain, the physical pain of childbirth is horrendous, but it's nothing compared to the pain and burden of caring for and praying for and raising a child to adulthood and beyond. Your battles, your battles, each one of us individually, I want to tell you my battles, when I fought my battles through life, they became my mother's battles. The burdens I bore while my mother was here, my mother bore them as well. My broken heart she experienced right along beside me. My victories and triumphs she gloried in. My pain, my pain was her pain. My shame was her shame. And my gain was her gain. Mothers give up sleep. They give up personal goals to help us meet our own. How many times have you wore a new outfit and your mother wore something that she got out of the back of the closet? How many times was there a delectable morsel left on the table and the last person to be served was not your mother, but you or your brother or your sister? So you see, God cares about a mother's love. Now, uh, Mothers have so much influence. She's not perfect. She has problems. But she loves you like no other person than God. And her words resonate to you down through the course of your life. I remember my mother writing on the front page of the Bible, the little, little Bible that she gave me when I left home to go to the army. I remember the message of encouragement to this very day. It's one of the reasons I believe that I love the Bible today. Your words, mothers, carry great influence. I read a story about a gentleman by the name of Albert Tuttle. Yes, Albert Tuttle. Albert Tuttle. What a, uh, what a unassuming name. Albert Tuttle. But let me tell you about Albert Tuttle. He, was, he served, he, he was born in the, the last few years of the 19th century. He died in the late 90s of, this, of, of the 1900s. And he, he did many things in life. He, was, he served in the, in the military during World War II, became, rose to the rank of general, was decorated with the Bronze Star, you know, many other decorations. When World War II was over, he left the military and he became a judge. And later he was appointed, Albert Tuttle was appointed to the Fifth Circuit Court by President Eisenhower. Uh, and the Fifth Circuit Court encompasses all of the Deep South states. You know, where they were in decades ago, there was so many issues, conflict, and, and so many people's civil rights were denied. 
Judge Tuttle served on the, the Fifth Circuit Court, and he became, in fact, on the sidewalk, the Civil Rights Walk of Fame in Atlanta, Georgia, has a star engraved in the sidewalk with his name under it because he became the Chief Justice of the Fifth Circuit, which was the court that became so instrumental in defining the civil rights of all American citizens. One day, Judge Tuttle was being interviewed by Walter Cronkite. And Walter Cronkite said, uh, Judge Tuttle said, I understand that you've never tasted whiskey. And this general from World War II had been decorated by the Bronze Star, who for courage and, and had the Purple Heart where he'd been wounded in combat and, and was such an a, a influential man. He replied to Walter Cronkite on national television. He said, that's right, I've never tasted alcohol in my life. And Walter, Walter Cronkite said to him, really? You've never tasted alcohol? Judge Tuttle said, no, I've never tasted alcohol. Walter Cronkite, Cronkite said, can you tell me why? And Judge Tuttle said, because my mother told me not to. Isn't that a wonderful story? Oh. So I want to tell you that God, God cares about the mother's love and the influence that she has over our lives. I have a couple other thoughts, but I think I've made my point adequately this morning.